much serious. And I ask this strange question. Where does God live? Where, where does God live? And, and I walk through why that is important. I walk, walk through the atmosphere where God lives. And, and, you know, we can learn a lot about where people live. We can learn about, about their, their expectations, about their, some other things about them. The, 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 the neighborhood they live in, the kind of house they buy, or education. And so I, I, I frame that question of understanding of God in the context of, their, of, of what's God's place like? What's the atmosphere? We've gone to places and the atmosphere has been bright and cheery and the music has been soft and, and you just feel like sitting there and hanging around for a lot. We've been in other places where the atmosphere has been kind of dark, dungy, and the loud, music loud and heavy and, and the atmosphere is not good at all. We couldn't wait to get out of there. Because the atmosphere, the atmosphere makes the place uh, either likable to us or dislikable. So we've been looking at the atmosphere where God lives in answering the question, where does he live? So we looked for a few moments in the Old Testament and we, we, we found out that his relationship with men in the Old Testament was completely different from his relationship with men in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God revealed himself through, through his dwelling in the tabernacle and through the sacrificial system. In the New Testament, God revealed himself to us through his son Jesus. And John then would write and say that he dwells within us. Paul would go so far as to say in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 to 20, how that we are now the temple or the dwelling place of God. And then we moved into the book of Revelation, and we looked at the fact that clearly God is enthroned in heaven. John said in the fourth chapter that he heard a voice saying, Come up hither, and when he came up, he saw a great throne set up in heaven and one sitting on the throne. Who looked like a jasper. We find it to be God Almighty, but later on we see when Jesus Christ comes and we see. So heaven then is the habitat, it's the, it's the, it's the dwelling place, it's the living place of God. And yet, don't misunderstand me, he is not confined to the heavens. But Old Testament and New Testament theology makes it quite clear that God has established his throne in the heavens. And from there he rules all the universe. And yet he feels all the universe because he's God and he cannot be confined to a particular location or a particular per per person or people. So he's, 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 he's all over. He's all in the universe. But he also reigns from his throne in heaven. So last week we took a few moments and probably about 45 minute moments. Or more, we looked at three things that characterize the atmosphere where God lives. For as we understand the atmosphere where God lives, we begin to understand God. And we begin to understand what God is used to and what God requires of us. The first thing we notice from Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, that, eight, that God lives in an atmosphere of holiness. Wow. That's the reason why as I talked this morning about revival, uh, that, uh, our first priority is to have a fresh glimpse of the holiness of God and that it's sober our lives. It's important that we understand that God is holy, church. God is not common. And God is not the big guy up there. God is not this kind of framework of understanding that he's something we can really put a frame to. God is God Almighty. And he desires his people to recognize. So God lives in an atmosphere of holiness. And secondly, we discover that God lives in an atmosphere of thanksgiving. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 9, we find the, the elders and the four and twenty just bowing down before him and worshiping and saying, holy, and then giving thanks and honor. He dwells in an atmosphere of thanksgiving. That's me. This week, my Paul said that the will of God for us is to be thankful. So this is the will of God and Christ Jesus is saying that you be thankful. Why? Because that's the atmosphere that God has. We saw how God, how God did not, was not one bit impressed with the murmurs in the Old Testament. And God is not impressed when you and I live a life of murmur, murmuring and complaining and, 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 and ungratefulness. But God, 
appreciates our heart and we are grateful to the Lord. Thirdly, we discover that God lives in the nature of amen, with the definition of amen being unity and agreement. We discover from the fifth chapter of Revelation, just touched on it because I'm going to read that tonight, that the, the elders and the and the and the, the four the four beasts and the four the, and the four and twenty elders uh, said amen. And the word amen means agreement in unity. And so God dwells in that sort of unity. Show me a, 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 a family in this union and, and it, 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 that family will lack the presence of God. Show me an individual that's, that's, that's disagreeable and, and always confronting somebody and confronting everything. And I'll show you a person who, who lacks the presence of God. Show me a church that's in disunity, and I'll show you, show you a church that God's presence is not there anymore. Because God dwells in that sort of unity. I didn't say conformity, I said unity. Not conformity, but unity. Where we, where we have a, how we walk in the purpose of God. And we walk in the will of God. And we walk in accordance with what God says. Tonight I want to share with you the fourth thing that characterizes the, the dwelling place of God. And I want you to turn with me to the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation. We're going to get a glimpse for a few moments tonight into an incredible worship service. The fifth chapter of the book of Revelation, John is reporting what he saw when he went to heaven. We believe, as, 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 as classical Pentecostals, that this fourth and fifth chapter is, is, the, is the rapture of the church and, and the scenes that John saw as he was caught up into heaven at the rapture in the fourth chapter. So John talks about all those things. Let me share with you. Now he comes to the fifth chapter. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice, Who is worthy? Underline that. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, at earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, John said, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I looked, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the, of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came, and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, God. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of orders, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, You are worthy. Remember what is said there in the second verse? Who is worthy? And the song of the redeemed was, Thou art worthy. To take the book and to open the seal of their all. For you were slain. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels. I want you to, for a moment to transfix yourself into the presence around the throne room and join this incredible worship service that's happening. I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands saying unto the loud voice, worthy of the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which uh, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying glory and heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Here is the worship of the Father and worship of the Son and the four and the beast said amen and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that lives Forever and ever. It must have been some kind of worship service. Amen. When the, when, when the redeemed of the Lord, when the, when the raptured saints and the resurrected saints finally converge around the throne of God and they identify the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world and in, in, in their incredible worship and atmosphere and praise, they said, Worthy is the Lamb, you are worthy. 
For you have redeemed us, amen. You have bought us with your own blood. You have redeemed us. You have set us free. You have given us eternal life. And the Bible says they worship the Lamb. It must have been a worship service. No place for you there if you're nervous. Come on, sir. That noisy bunch. Oh, this chapter, this whole chapter of five is, uh, of Revelation is all about one theme only, and that theme is worship. God dwells in an atmosphere of worship. I said God dwells in an atmosphere of worship. Not forced worship, not bondage worship, but worthy worship. And listen to the ninth verse again. It says in the ninth verse, Thou art worthy. To, to take the book, you are worthy. In the 12th verse, the psalm says, worthy is the lamb that was slain. So it, 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 it's a deserved, worthy worship. Well, what do we mean by worship? That is the fourth thing that characterizes the place where God dwells. Worship. But what do we mean by worship? Worship is probably more misunderstood than understood. Worship is probably more misconstrued than it is done properly. And tonight I want to share some things with you that I believe is significant as we invite the Lord Jesus Christ to take us to a new level as we serve Him and as we work for Him. One writer has called worship the rare jewel. The rare jewel. And it's rare for, for obvious reasons. Let me just state this at the beginning. I believe... That there is activity that happens in the body of Christ, which is true worship. I believe that. But I also believe that there is activity that happens in the body of Christ that is not true worship. It's more like corruption. You say, Pastor, that's a strong word. I know. God had to tell Moses the same thing. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 7, Moses comes down from the mountain and hears a, hears a crowd. And he, he, he's talking to Joshua and saying, well, it sounds like... There's war in the camp. And then Joshua says, no, it sounds like it's singing. It sounds like it's, 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 it's rejoicing. It's celebration. So Moses was debating with all about all of this stuff. What it is. And of course, you know what it was, right? It was, it was the Israelites worshiping the calf. That's right. There's some powerful messages there. And I won't go there tonight. But, but uh, it's, under, it's, it's important for you to understand that, that Aaron was complicit in this. And put together the calf and said to Israel, Behold, Israel, here is the, your Lord that brought you out of Egypt. And you say, you say, but but wasn't that a completely wasn't that completely dumb of, of, of Aaron? Look, yes, it was. But what, what was even more confusing was Aaron used the word Lord, Adonia, the, the word for Almighty God. So what they had taken, they had taken Almighty God and put him into a form that they could they could recognize, and, and they said, This is our God, and they and they worship. And so Moses drew a little closer, and God sorted them out on what was going on here. God said, Moses, that's not worship, that's corruption. That my people have corrupted themselves. But God, I thought it was worship. It sounded like worship, it sounded like praise, it sounded. God said, that's corruption. Because it's, it's misappropriated, it's misused, it's, it's completely off track. I've seen, I've seen activity in church just like that, and, 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 and we call it worship. And I've seen true worship in church as well. And I thank God for true worship. So we want to talk about some things tonight, about what worship really is. See, scriptures clearly define <coughs> worship as a priority for God's people. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 23, that, that the time is coming now is when the, when, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and such people God seeks to worship Him. So it, it's very clear. I won't go through the scriptures. I have others here, but I won't go through the scriptures. Luke chapter 4, verse 8 talks again about the centrality of worship. Worship is important, and is a, it should be a priority for God's people. In fact, let me, let me just get a little stronger tonight. It is the first calling. You say, Pastor, what do you mean it's the first calling? We are called to be worshipers before we're called to be workers. <laughs> Let me say that again because it's important for us to understand that. It is the first calling. It surpasses the call to ministry. God forgive us if you have ever, ever have a pastor in this pulpit 
who don't know how to worship. For worship comes before working. Worship comes before ministry because worship is a call to be. It's a call to be, whereas ministry is a call to do. And God wants us to be before he wants us to do. Amen. One cannot really do until one has learned to be. Amen. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness before he could, he could fully recognize the power of God in his life. He had to be broken in a lot of things. Like many of us, we have to be broken in, in some things that, that, that are natural in our lives that, 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 that God needs to get his hand on. And so we're all going to go and do things, but we're not going to spend time in God's presence and worship him. And God says, before you can do, you must be. That's the reason why a lot of works that's done in the church is done in the flesh. And they create problems and schisms and, and they never get on solid ground because the people involved want to be, do before they are. God calls us first to worship. God calls us first to worship. And we worship us. Let me share the following statements with you to substantiate the fact that what I'm saying tonight is, has been seen by, by, by incredible um, Wise, wiser men than me. Many of you know A.W. Tozier. He said, we are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. That's what worship is. A preoccupation with God. Man was made to worship God. There is, see, everybody on earth worships something. Everybody on earth as to find that higher thing that they look to. That's the reason why you have all the religions and all the faiths and all the gods and all the things like that. Even people who don't recognize gods as, as, as even essential to the human being will, will worship their work or worship their career or worship their... They'll worship something. They'll worship... In fact, we live in a world of self-worship. We live in a world of self-worship. Because there is, there is within man the need to worship something. And man, because man was created to worship God. When sin came in and, 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 and threw the form or haywire, then, then, then man began to worship all kinds of things. Look at Paul writing to the Romans. That man began to worship four-footed beasts and turned the image of God into the image of a beast and turned their understanding of God into an image of a beast. And they worshiped the, the creature more than the creator. You say, why didn't they, why didn't they just, like, if they turn their back on God, why didn't they just forget about it and just go on? No, there's something inside a man that calls him to worship something. Calls him to worship something. Because man was created to worship God. Tozier goes on to say, we're here to be worshipers first and workers only second. We take a convert and immediately make a worker out of him. God never meant it to be so. God meant that a convert should learn to be a worshiper. And after that, he can learn to be a worker. Amen? Amen? The work done by a worshiper will have eternity in it. I like that. Amen. I like it, but sometimes we, 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 we think of the little, the little mom who has very little education, very little skill, but she's faithfully uh, worshiping God, and then she becomes a, a Sunday school teacher or a BG leader. She has no great uh, record of education or accomplishments, but she worships and she works for the Lord. Amen? I tell you, the fruit of her work will last into eternity. The fruit of her work will last into eternity. A.P. Gibbs made this statement, that quality of worship which does not result in service, and that service which does not flow from worship, both fall short of the divine ideal. I thought that was significant. The quality of worship which does not result in service, and that service which does not flow from worship, both come short of the divine ideal. What a call to all of us tonight. All of us kind of want to get busy doing things for God, don't we? It's a temptation for every church. It's a temptation for every pastor to just do, do, do. But God is calling us first to do, to be worshipers, to worship God, to make God the priority of our lives. He, Austin Sparks, said the beginning of everything in relationship to God is worship. That is God having the central and supreme place of recognition of acknowledgement of government. 
God has the supreme right in our complete obedience and surrender in every part and phase of our being. Worship begins there. It is a relationship, not only an exercise. Wow. It is not something that we do in specified ways and methods. It is an attitude of the life. Listen to that line. It is not something we do in specified ways and methods. It is an attitude of the life. A place that God has in the entire consciousness that is worship. Worship. David Ravenhill said, everything in our Christian lives is to flow from worship. The quality of our service and discipleship depends on the quality of our worship. Church, he says, we need to wake up. That which God deems to be the most important is what we relegate the least amount of time to. Amen. That which God calls most important is what we give least time to. We're so busy doing things when God is saying, I want you to, to not be so busy and to learn how to worship. You see, here is, here, is, here is one thing that we need to be careful with. Most of us see that short period of time when we are singing and playing music as the worship time. In the minds of most of you now, we're finished with the worship. Amen? Amen? Yes, absolutely. But how long is your worship time? Well, we worship for about 25, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I think I'm going to come to your church. <laughs> how long is the worship time? We worship for about three hours. <laughs> you won't see me there. <laughs> so you mean you worship three hours, and then you preach, and then you pray, and then you anoint the Lord, and then you share communion? No. No, I mean everything we do ought to be worship. And we're so wrong to see worship at that little period of time when the musicians and the singers lead us in, 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 in songs and we worship together. You see, our whole life is meant to be an act of worship. Every action should be motivated by worship. Wouldn't that kind of change some of the things we do? Even before we do them, we say, now Lord, I'm about to do this. Is this going to worship you or not? Every word ought to be worship-focused. Every word we speak ought to be worship-focused. You mean that we got to go around all the time? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. No. I don't mean that. I mean that the words of our mouth ought to reflect an atmosphere of worship unto God. Amen. So that means my words to you will be encouraging, not discouraging. It means my words will be uplifting, not critical. Oh, Pastor, that was too hard. You shouldn't have said that, Pastor. That you knew. God knows. That if our words were worship focused and our actions were God were worship focused, we'd probably say and do more things that honor God than we do. Amen. I know what you may preach it. But it's good stuff. It'll help me get over a few things. The question we must ask is, who or what is the object of our worship? Ah, uh, I want to go to Peel because they have good worship. <clears throat> I ain't going to that church. It's dead. I ain't going to go there, man. It, it, that, 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 that's music from a funeral home. <laughs> we need to be careful that we don't start worshiping worship. <laughs> good thing I'm going away. <laughs> we need to be careful that we don't worship worship. Folk, we can come to the place where we worship worship. God is not the object, it is the building hands move. <laughs> I fear today that there is a tendency to worship worship more than worshiping God. Let me explain that. Today's Christian churches are promoting worship that focuses on making the person feel good. Oh, I feel good. If that's so, then we are very close to worshiping ourselves, which is idolatry. Yes. This is what I just said. Oh, I love it. I feel good to worship. Oh, that gives me a message. I make it feel good. It's not wrong to feel good. But if you begin to, if that becomes your focus, then you're worshiping yourself. 
You are worshiping yourself. I'm worshiping myself. When I say, oh, keep singing, man, this is doing me good. See, worship is not for my good. Worship is to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God will honor it. If we feel good, if God puts us into our spirit, that's fine. But if that's the, if that's the gist of it, then I'm only going to sing what makes me feel good. I'm only going to play. No, I'm not going to play nothing. <laughs> I'm only going to have play, but make me feel good. See, worship is not about me and you receiving anything. Worship is about us giving. Yes. It's about us giving unto God that which is worthy of, that which is, 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 is he deserves. See, in fact, some forms of worship have strong sexual overtones. Arousing the sexual nature within us. I've seen that, folks. You must call God worship. And it is nothing close to God worship. See, the human psyche is, is a very complicated thing. And, 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 and music and, and, and gestures and movements can stir some incredible, powerful emotions. And when they are performed to satisfy people, it will ignite the sexual passion. And we've had people walk out of buildings where God was supposed to be praised, and they are sexually aroused because of the activity they were just in. That's pretty straight preaching, but it's true. Mm. Love me now. <laughs> I have seen people get caught up in the what. I watch, I watch, I watch people get caught up in the what and lose out truly worshiping God. Some people use banners. Some people do dancing. Some people do waving. Others, other physical expressions. And, and, and what happens is they get caught up in what's going on and, and completely ignore worshiping God. I, when I get into the atmosphere, I look around. No, I don't keep my eyes closed. I look around. And I see somebody worshiping, and I see someone else just getting a great kick out of what they're doing. So you see, when any form of worship distracts from God and attracts to me or attracts to you, it's not worship. It's not worship. It's not to do with what we're doing. It's to do, it's to do with, with, with our attitude and, and the atmosphere we're in. Our sister here with the red on, she, sometimes she'll get up and worship God and praise God, and it's wonderful. That's her expression. But when we all stop and look at her, right? I've gone to churches where they wave banners. I don't know if I want to wave banners as long as I'm worshiping God. If you're going to wave a banner just because you want to be seen, keep the banner to yourself. Nothing we do in worship should attract attention to ourselves. Amen. Nothing we do in worship should attract attention to ourselves. God is not so much taken up in the expression of our worship as he is in the intent of our worship when we just get lost in your life. We need to, we need to, to understand that. See, most evangelical worship today is an emotion-centered experience. And you fellas know I get excited. Nobody loves a little bit of excitement more than I do. But our worship cannot be emotion-centered. Our worship has got to be centered on the holiness, the greatness, the majesty, and the awe with which we see God. Amen. Amen. That's worship. That's worship. Now, on the other hand, those of us who simply refuse to set our hearts and minds to the majesty of God, and we refuse to participate, is just as, as guilty of not worshiping. The crowd that may be in the flesh and, 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 and they're not, they think they're worshiping and, and they're only worshiping themselves. The crowd that sits back and says, I certainly wouldn't do that. You, you wouldn't lift your hand or close your eyes or lift your voice to pray. Look, you're just as guilty as the other crowd. That's right. That's right. God called us to worship and there's some physical response to worship. Look at the book of Revelation and you'll see a falling down, you'll see a praise, you'll see an expression in righteousness and holiness. Let's, not be, care let's be careful not to worship worship. And certainly let's not, be, let's not be careful, let's be careful not to worship the worshiper. 
We pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars for a ticket to go listen to a Christian entertainer, and we call it worship. And all we're doing is financing someone and worshiping them. That's right. That's right. We have made some of those guys filthy rich. And if you knew their lifestyle, you'd want your money back. <laughs> because we have paid the worshiper to entice us. Now don't go the other thing and say you don't believe in, yes I do believe in good gospel ordained singers who minister in the spirit of God and minister to people and I think God have blessed them with a good offering, God have blessed them and their ministry that God has given them, but we've come to a place where we've made high cons out of Christian singers. And I had heard some names and the next thing I knew that they were, their marriage was in trouble and their life was in trouble and there was all kinds of hopeless things going on with their ministry. And we paid for it. Shame on us and call it worship. I know I'm being tough tonight, but God has called me to minister the word of God. And where God lives is a place of holy worship. Amen. Amen. It's a place of holy worship. So we haven't got it all right. And we're a long way from perfect. But I think that there's something you said for trying to get closer to God that we let go all the strings and say, let's do everything. Eh? Yes. I believe God is calling us to draw closer to Him. Amen. Draw on closer to Him. You see, to worship, worship, or to worship a worshiper, it would become idolatry. See, let me just put it this way. The means must never eclipse the object. We get so taken up with the means, with the music, or the uh, singing ability of the choir, or the singing ability of the individual, or the incredible, incredible music power. We get so taken up with that, we forget what was all focused on. The means became more important than the object. The object was God. The means was all these other things. And suddenly we find ourselves praising the other things rather than God. You say, great question. This tonight reminds me of Buckley's mixture. <laughs> Tastes terrible, but it works. <laughs> we worship because worship is our response to all of God's goodness towards us. God has shown us love, grace, mercy, kindness, and so much more. And so, therefore, our natural response is to worship. Amen. Amen. You might worship by humming. Others might worship by singing. Others who have, can't sing and can't hum, they just worship maybe by just, just reflecting upon God's goodness. And maybe in a quiet moment, nothing going on, you're going to say, Thank you, Jesus. We say, What's that for? Praise you, Jesus. It's just their expression. But you see, we worship out of the heart of gratefulness for what God has done. Yes. It's got nothing to do with how we feel. God has shown us these things. Worship is my thank you, God, for showing me who you are and for your goodness to me. That's what worship is. What did, the, what did the crowd say here in the fifth chapter of Revelation? Listen, they're worshiping God. They're worshiping God. And they're saying, because you that were slain, you deserve all these honors and all these glory. You have redeemed us by, to God, by your blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. You have made us unto our God, kings and priests. You have taken the filthy and the vile, and you have taken what should have been rejected, and by your shed blood, you have elevated us to positions of kings and priests with God. Thank you, Father! Amen. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. See, worship doesn't have to be an army. And worship, you don't have to practice. It comes natural out of a heart that's been touched by the grace of God, and you just want to say thank you. And God forgive us if we ever get to a place where we 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 we, we got to have all our singing just right in order to worship. See, God don't care if you sound like a, a nightingale or like a crow, <laughs> because it's the heart that God sings. Amen. You and I hear a, 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 a 
oh, and you say, oh, God, let that be jealous. And God hears a heart that's so much in love with him that he won't even hear the cold. And then you hear someone who's finely tuned. And they got it just right. And they're singing to perfection. And they're so glad they're doing such a great job. And they're so proud of their boys. And God is saying, oh, who's got the bad sound? And he goes back and listens to the world. <laughs> See, to know God is to worship Him. When you know God, when I, when I wake in the middle of the night and I realize that I'm saved, and I realize because of his blood, my son in India is in the covenant. Woo! I says, Hallelujah! So I don't wait for a minute. Thank you. <laughs> because he's done so much. When was the last time out of nowhere? He said, Thank you, Lord. You know, I'm thanking God for the gospel today more than before. Every time I see darkness, bondage, and deception, and falsehood, I just talk to him. See, worship transforms us. Both the way we think and the way we live. In fact, worship is the highest expression of the amen atmosphere that I spoke about last Sunday. I said, God lives in the atmosphere of, of, of holiness, thanksgiving, and amen. Amen being the atmosphere of, un of unity and agreement with God in His divine purpose. And, and, and worship is that, is that expression of amen. Worship is acting according to God's will, living in obedience to His Word. That's why it is impossible to worship God at the same time you are walking in disagreement with or disobedience to God. You're worshiping dry lately? Maybe you need to get along with God and look at your life. Because it's impossible to worship God when our lives are in disagreement with His will and in disobedience to His directions. I just love that there's a, there's, a, there's a theological principle of all you great ministers like Brother Hill and all about called, the, called the, the principle of first mention. So it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a hermeneutical principle, meaning it's a principle that, that, that you study when, when you look at things in the Word of God. And it's called the, 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 the principle of first mention. It simply means wherever a, 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 a significant word, not a word like and, and the, and is, and if, and all, but a significant word, wherever the context of that is mentioned in, it's, it's significant. The first time it's mentioned. Who knows the first place that worship was mentioned in the scriptures? It was mentioned in, in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 22. And you know how word comes? It wasn't in a church service. Abraham wasn't having a, a great church servant with Sarah and with his, his servants. He wouldn't have a Sunday morning or a, or a Sabbath morning uh, service with his servant, no. You know where it came from? It came from his lips when he was going up to a hill to sacrifice Isaac. They traveled for three days. And then the Bible says Isaac, Abraham said to his servants that had gone with him from his home, he said, you folks stay here. Myself and the lad, referring to Isaac, are going yonder to worship and we'll come back again. Yes. Do what? Hey, Abraham, just a second. Just a second, Abraham. You're going up there to worship. Yes, we're going to worship. Hey, Abraham, what happened to this idea of going up there to sacrifice your son Isaac? See, worship, first mention, is in the context of sacrifice and the context of obedience. See, here's what's wrong with the church today. We want, to, we want to walk in this obedience to God. We want to live our own way. We want to just practice the book and only use the part that we could do it. And then we want to come into His presence and we want to worship and feel His presence. It ain't going to happen. God is calling for obedience, surrender, and sacrifice before our worship can be acceptable. <coughs> May as well get your mind around that too. You can have you can have a uh, Italio, 
You can have a hoopla, you can have a meltdown, you can have a hold down, you can have anything else and put Christian on it, but it won't <laughs> worship until you walk in obedience and right. sacrifice and surrender to Almighty God. Amen. 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 You know what I'm saying? That's the atmosphere that God inhabits. That's where God dwells. You see, that it's impossible on a people in agreement. At the end of the day, the object of our love is the object of our worship. <laughs> Let me say that again. At the end of the day, the object of our love is the object of our worship. The thing that you love most is the thing that you will worship. That's the reason why our brothers and sisters in third world countries who are living their lives for, the, for Jesus Christ can do it and not, and not turn their back on Christ because they love him more than they love their lives. That's the reason why a, 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 a mom can watch her daughter being put to death for the sake of the gospel because she loves God more than she loves her daughter's life. I know these are our, our tough principles, and I hope not one of you ever got a goal of putting that place. But listen, the thing you love is the thing you worship. Isn't that true? When you first fell in love with your mate, you worship that person. There was nothing you wouldn't do for him or her. Isn't that true? Why? Because you love. Yes. You really love God. They got your full attention. Why? Because you worship them because you love them. Don't you think that Jesus had that exercise in mind when he when he confronted Peter on the beach uh, a few days a few days before he ascended to heaven in John chapter 21 when when, when they had the meal of fish and brews and, 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 and saw fish and onions and sponges on the on, 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 on the beach with the potatoes and and Jesus knew how much Peter was loving that. He was out there fishing, and Peter was a fisherman. He'd gone back to fishing and took a bunch of the boys with him. Jesus knew that, and so when Jesus got him on the shore and, 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 and got him around the table and fed him up good, then he let loose on Peter. He said, Peter, you love me more than these? And when he said, these, you know what he pointed at? The nets and the boat. Keep in mind, there were 153 fish in that net, and six men never read that, even if they were no commanders. <laughs> There was a lot of fish left there on that shore and in that net. And Jesus looked squarely at it and said, Now, Peter, do you love me more than you love that? Peter said, You know I love you. He said, Go feed my lambs. Peter thought, Go Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than you love these? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you more than I love these. Go feed my sheep. And the third time, and this pushed poor old Peter. He said, Lord, he said, Peter, do you love me more than you love these? And Peter said, Peter said, Jesus, you know all things. You know I love you more, more than I love these. He said, go feed my sheep. Why did Jesus ask Peter three times if he loved the, 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 him more than he loved the boat and the fish? Simple, very simple. Because he asked him one time for every time he denied him. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus have to get a confirmation from Peter? Three times. God would kick our butt in things. How many of you know that? Yeah. See, Jesus knew that the object of Peter's love would eventually become the thing he worshipped. And if he could not confront the truth that he wanted to be finished with this fishing business and go and preach the gospel, Peter, Jesus knew that Peter would one day love the fishing boat more than the pulpit. A lot of preachers have gone back because they, things didn't work out for them. They left the pulpit and went back to some electric office. <laughs> Selling insurance. Find something to do. Folks, what you love will become what you worship. There's no doubt about that. John 4, 23, 24 talks about worshiping in the spirit and in truth. Jesus was talking about the priority and purity of worship. Purity of worship. What does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? It is the internal qualities of the heart and spirit towards God, not the external expressions we use. Where's our hearts? Where's our hearts? Where's our spirits? Are we right with God? Do we bring into his presence a, a humble and broken heart and spirit that says, God, I'm standing imperfect in your presence. Thank you for your grace. There's still a lot of work, but Lord, I want to worship you. 
Or do we come in saying, oh God, you are so fortunate to have me as one of your worshipers. I, I, I make such a difference in the church. When I raise my voice, everybody listens. The spirit and truth comes from the humility, the brokenness of heart, and the recognition that we stand in God's presence only by His grace, not because we're gifted to do great things. Amen. It's spirit and truth. When true worship comes from the heart, the external expression will honor God. One writer said, God is looking for honest sincerity, honesty, sincerity, and humility. That's what it means to worship in spirit and in truth, in the beauty of holiness. Worship is a lifestyle that says we love God above all things and we surrender to his will. See, I don't know if it's our upbringing, I don't know if it's our, it's our past, I don't know if it's our bad teaching. But, but, but we are prone sometimes to think that worship is just what we do in church. And when we walk through the door, that's it. <coughs> worship is being polite to people who are impolite. Ah, that's what they did to me some fun I go back in. And they're not going to get over my time, no sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show them, boss. <laughs> Worship is, 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 is the expression of our life to the world that God is changing. Everything I say, everything I do ought to be worship focused. God, how is this going to honor you? When my buddy across the street is stuck in his driveway, because he's got a little low car, I'm looking up through the window and I'm saying, God, I should have. I've got a four wheel deal to drive, drive you. But it's snowing and it's miserable. And Lord, I just had a shower. And and mom, we're all beating strong. I don't want to watch the last, I don't want to lose the last part of the third. <laughs> then I say, no, Lord, I'm going to be a good neighbor. I'm putting on my snow suit, and I'm putting on what I need, and I'm going to get it there and back up my full wheel drive, and I'm going to take that guy out of that snow bank, and I'm going to do it for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Whether he says, thank you, sir, you're a good neighbor, or says, I can do it myself. Doesn't make any difference. I done it for Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. When we do it for Jesus, when we say it for Jesus, somebody may not appreciate it, but he does. Yeah. It's an act of worship. Our worship is a lifestyle. Yeah. Pastor Mitchell's coming back. Upon finding that place of worship, then are we ready for divine encounters? Amen. Imagine, imagine 400, 500 people gathering here at Peel Pentecost on Sunday morning who all week will worship God in word and seeing and whose hearts are together in worship. You imagine the kind of glory that God is going to pour in when you come together as a body of believers. That's what we're talking about. There's something like, oh, the service was so dry, the service was so hard. Maybe because we didn't invest in it during the week. Boy, we wish the pastor would spend more time in prayer and preach more lively messages. Yeah, that could kill you, sure, sitting in that for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> but if we all come with an art, heart of worship and an act of worship in our lives have been given to God in worship, the glory of God comes down when we join together and begin to worship and pray and sing and walk by God and it don't make any difference what the week was like. God came down. Can you imagine what God would do in the midst of 600 people who came to worship the Lord? I think God would look at the angel and say, listen, get the problem over there in our ranch. Go over there for a couple of hours. I'm, I'm fixed here in Brampton. I'm liking what I'm hearing here at Field Penny College. I got five, six hundred people gathered and they're worshiping me. Go fix some of those problems down in the States. I'm saying here, I'm going to take the worship of my people. Amen. I believe that. It's not quite that now, but that's the whole idea. God shows up where he's worshiped. Mm. God shows up where he's worshiped. I want to say to every one of you that have your house, that have your own home or your apartment building, you can make your house, you can make your apartment, you can make your basement apartment, you can make your one room apartment or your ten bedroom house a place of worship. Amen. You can fill the halls of that place and the rooms of that place with praises unto the Lord. 
You can have music that's glorifying God and have your heart come thank you to Jesus. Amen. You can fill the heart of your children with act of worship and the song of worship and praise. May not always be in tune, but I tell you something, it'll penetrate your young lives. It'll lay a foundation and you'll know something about mom and dad who are loving God and worshipers. Amen. Amen. Send them off to school in the morning, not hearing mom barking at dad or dad barking at mom or screeching at the kids to get this and get that and get something else on. Send them to school with the sound of you singing praise unto the Lord. Yes, the clothes were burned. Yes, the bus may have been late. Yes, it might be raining out. But give the Lord praise. Amen. Give the Lord Forever and ever, we just have 